and we're live. I'm here with Ethan, and we are discussing probably one of the more unheralded directors in the pantheon of horror directors. This is for your Halloween hangover of sorts. It is Zulowski. Um Ethan, I think there's two different camps as far as people who have heard of this director, and I'm interested to hear how you heard of him because I think there's two big movies that a lot of people have heard of. Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, well, I think the the one that most people remember is Possession. Uh, it's a lot of a lot of uh, f- film buffs. It's a lot of their favorite movies. It's kind of a one of the great cult classics of the '80s. Uh, for good reason, and uh, but not a lot of people know his other movies. Maybe on the Silver Globe is his close, distant second most well-known movie. But I, I only really knew him for Possession. Yeah, so I, I, n- I never put the pieces together as far as uh, on the Silver Globe and Possession being the same guy. Um, yeah. It only did that kind of recently as we began to embark on this video together. And, you know, I think Criterion or maybe on Letterbox was where I really started to, to see Zulowski's films pushed. And Possession is one that we're going to be covering. And like you said, I think that gets the most traction on Letterbox and uh, the yeah. most popularity. But the other yes. two that we've seen you know, I think are very enjoyable, very thoughtful and very well done, but they don't yeah. get nearly as much traction or I guess reverence, maybe not as much reverence as they really should. Uh, do you kind yeah. of agree with that sentiment? Yeah, I do. I watching his movies, watching more of his movies just makes me realize that he has one of the most distinct styles of direction I have ever seen. Usually very chaotic and surreal but odd, like oddly great looking like the cinematography is usually great in a weird bizarre way but it works so well um and his dialogue is usually kind of forgettable and just kind of goes with the flow of the chaotic story i completely agree with you um and a lot of the chaos can play out directly and and it seems to be a hallmark of him where one like one character will almost play out the chaos that is happening within the story. It's yeah. seen, seen in possession. I'm pretty sure it happens in devil or, you know, Diabelle. And then I, I'm trying to think it might also happen in the third part of the night. And they're pretty kind of vaguely. Yeah. It's one of the most iconic scenes from possession though. And you're right. He captures like this surreal, almost nightmarish, you know, atmosphere. And that seems to be one of the hallmarks of a great horror director. And it's, yeah. it's kind of strange that he isn't mentioned so much uh, when you talk about like a Wes Craven or a John Carpenter or the, the you know, the likes of those horror legends. And Absolutely. It, why do you think that is? Uh, well, those first off, those directors are, American, who mm-hmm. knows? Maybe in Poland he was very big. Um, actually, no. In uh, we'll get to get to it when we get to it. But I don't think he was big in Poland. He might have been big in like Germany or France. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you, it's kind of you can't find uh, his big mo- uh, his movies on like any big streaming platforms. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh... And, and I know you experienced that yeah. and, and I did as well. It's it's they are just almost impossible to find. And yeah. there's another Theophilopolis moment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I feel like a lot of people are going to be like, yeah, I've won it. You know, I had someone on my letterbox. They were like, I've been wanting to watch these films. Where the heck do you get them? And you kind of have to go. Um, outside outside of the normal lines to to watch these films, uh, for yeah. lack of a better term, which yeah, that opens up a whole kind of intriguing discussion. I think uh, d- between like the the moral compass of trying to find these films, but I th- I think the the best counter argument is 
that art should ultimately be consumed and appreciated. And yep. if people aren't able to find these films, I just feel like a wonderful director like Luke Zulowski could easily be forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. I think Zulowski, I feel like one more great movie and he has the potential to be one of my favorite horror directors. He's very consistent with how good he, he is able to maintain his chaotic style throughout his films. I completely agree. And like you said, it's such a distinct uh, directorial vision and he, he paints his pictures in such a way that you can tell it's his film. And there's a lot of uh, things that kind of repeat in these films, like doppelgangers is, is something that he's always kind of been throwing into his films. Yeah. I wonder why I, that might be like a deep seated fear for him that he, you know, ultimately you try to draw from yourself, but yeah. Uh, and not a lot of other directors do that, obviously, especially in multiple movies and uh, the chaos, like you said. And I feel like he just has so many strengths that that, you know, we're going to go over throughout yes. this this episode. Yeah. Uh, starting with the first movie, and I could be wrong on this, but I think it is. Andre Zulowski's first feature film. It's the third part of yep. the night. Um, it is indeed. This is a strange one for sure. Pretty, you know, cerebral. I think it messes with your head for certain, but it's it's set during World War II. Uh, Poland has kind of been taken over, for lack of a better term, and, and people are trying to make livings in, in very strange ways. We have the main protagonist family uh, murdered in front of him. And then it sets him on this journey that has him, you know, run into different people and kind of sets the, the table for what's to happen in the movie. Uh, what were your first impressions on this one? Ethan? This was my this was my third uh, Zulowski film. I had watched Diabelle before. So I was expecting something kind of similar in tone, but very different in its approach to its themes. Um, I was correct on both fronts. It starts, it starts off less chaotic um, in terms of like, because Diabelle starts off very chaotic. Possession starts off kind of chaotic, but this starts off relatively tame by comparison. But then, like, once you get into the weeds of it, it becomes very chaotic. Yes. Um, it, and, and it was like a shocking... It was almost like jumping into cold water, uh, this film, as far as I'm concerned. Because it starts out very dramatic with the murder of his family. But it starts to go off the rails more and more as, as the movie progresses. And uh, that's when, I, in my opinion, you start to get a true feel for Zulowski as a director. Yeah, certainly. And uh, it, it felt very much Tarkovsky inspired. Do you, did you kind of find that at all, Ethan? It, yeah, maybe a little bit just because of the, um, the random locate, like the ever changing locations it is almost feels like science fiction esque. Um, the, it did the story kind of remind me remind me of a surreal version of vertigo like okay fan, uh, a guy who whose people he loves get are just murdered in front of his eyes and um it's been speculated that the film is about uh survivor's guilt and um okay how people deal with the the trauma of that sort of situation I have to say that, I mean, that that kind of theory seems to make a lot of sense to me and, and how that can play such a toll on your mentality. Like, you know, you are the lone survivor. And while you're lucky in a sense that you're still alive, I mean, you have the displeasure of of having to see people you love uh, killed in front of you. And I think that's what very much leads to him 
kind of seeing them in places that they're not. It's almost like he can't cope with their being gone. Yeah. I, what were some of the things that were were most effective for you in this movie? Um. Well, the thing is, is like it's kind of a blur for me for this for this movie in particular it was kind of a blur. Mm-hmm. Uh, with most of his movies, I just get the general feeling of them. Um, I guess one scene that really stuck out to me was um, when he uh, finds the his, the doppelganger of his wife, and uh, she's about to give birth to her baby, and he has to to help her, and it it, it kind of sets in motion this this flashback sequence where he starts to go crazy exactly that scene was it was pretty intense you know and it's one that i think is it's really easy to kind of draw back to and like you know remember in great detail because he did a great job at making what is a really intense moment like having to give birth on your own in a terrible environment he makes it as tense and builds drama there where, you know, it it, it should yeah. have been. Yeah, I think this movie in particular is a bit more, like, uh, outwardly bleak than the other two, just because it's World War Two and it combined. It, I, re- I coming to the realization that Zulovsky likes to take real world events and kind of, it, that's your gateway into this this story which is kind of unique and interesting and that world war ii setting creates kind of like a stark uh macabre story and it's like it's totally appropriate because if that's kind of the outlook you're going for i mean poland world war ii is the setting that you go for because yeah. you know few places were were getting hit nearly as hard as them um yeah there was a huge part of the plot and it had to do with the lice and kind of people being feeders for lice and it it kind of took me like I don't know how long, a lot longer probably than it should have to understand what they were even trying to do. And I still might have it wrong. Was it to get a vaccine for typhus or was it to use as a, a weapon against German troops? Um, do they, I, do they outwardly say it? I'm not so sure. Um, it could be either, either one, really. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I came in with the conception because I, I think it's in like the blurb that it has something to do with you know fleas and typhus, and that I think I just drew a conclusion, and I and they might have said it was. F- I mean, they kept talking about how people were becoming immune. And then that confused me as to, like, is that the goal of this? Um, But I thought it was like a metaphorical thing to kind of show how ludicrous operations were going during the World War Two time period. But then I think I saw that this was actually based on a real operation that was happening. Did you see that too, Ethan? I did not. And I drop in the comments if I'm dead wrong, because I now want to know. Um, But I think I saw somewhere that this was based on things that I think Polish people were actually doing during World War II. And uh, obviously the reason I'm not sure why, but... um, that makes those scenes like so much weirder with the knowledge that that actually happened. If it actually happened, that is. Yeah. that That's very interesting. I think it was based on, I think it was, it might've been based off of something real, uh, connected to Zulovsky. I'm not entirely sure, but, um, 
yeah, that's that's really interesting. If it was based off like a actual sur- like a actual surgery procedure that they were trying. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that you know I think I've read somewhere that I'm more positive is true is I think the Japanese like they would use I think plague infested I think fleas if not ticks and they would place them in incendiary bombs so that you know if the bomb didn't get you then there would be like a a, you know a outbreak of the plague or some really terrible disease so i'm not sure if that's maybe the inspiration for this movie i thought i read that this was like pretty much drawn straight from an actual event um either way there is some semblance of truth that goes behind it and um were you kind of like was your skin crawling during the scenes where they had those boxes on their legs and they just had to sit there yeah, that's yeah, that's. I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, one more thing, and you know, I want to get your perspective because you have experience behind the lens. Which, by the way, check out Ethan's channel down in the description. He has great, a, a great analysis of Chinatown and also has two short films on his channel that you should definitely check out. And speaking from your experience, did you find not only in this film, but the other two films that Zulowski was definitely, he had some great experience when it came to cinematography and getting interesting shots. Yes. Uh, he definitely one thing he loves is handheld camera. Hmm. He, He just loves the, it's it, there's like a documentary look to uh, his his cinematography because of that handheld camera mm. and um, the way he does like tracking shots is is so well done uh, a lot of really cool circular pans like the way mm. the camera will circle around a character um, I saw that more in possession but I also saw a lot of it in the third part of the night. Less so in Diabelle, but Diabelle is a lot more chaotic, I think. It might be his most chaotic movie. Oh, I, I, I completely agree with you. And on both points, those circling shots, like, it's it almost made you feel like you were kind of in that vortex of whatever crazy scenario was unfolding when you're circling it. it, it yeah. And, uh, that has to be like, what is the kind of the mindset on how you choose to shoot something? I guess it, that's an interesting question for me because I don't, is it just something that that's how you imagine a scene unfolding and, and that nature just fits right into how you imagine it? Or like for directors, do they get a sense this can add to it? I mean, do you, oh, yeah. do you have any take on kind of the process of how things like that are decided? Oh, yeah, there is uh, definitely uh, there's definitely some thought that should at least go into um, how your cinematography sets the tone of your of your movie. Um, it doesn't have to be super like blase style cinematography and it. it, it the camera can become a character in and of itself. Mm. Like, um, like with this movie, obviously, like it's a lot of chaos, and he shoot and he shoots these with a lot of um, shaky handheld camera shots and a lot of camera move movement, but in a way that's not like Michael Bay, where <laughs> he's just moving the camera wherever the the heck he wants to move it. It is it does feel planned. Like it does feel like when the camera is moving, there's a sense of purpose to it. Yeah, exactly. And it obviously, it feels effective. And like you said, Mm -hmm. with like a Michael Bay or there's kind of notorious movies that have what they call shaky cam. And I'm sure you've definitely heard about that a lot. Michael Bay is infamous (laughs) for it. This, it feels calculated. It feels like there's a purpose behind him doing that, and it leads to some some pretty great shots. I feel. 
Yeah, certainly. Was there any scenes that that you that resonated with you? I know you mentioned the birth scene. Was there any additional scenes that stuck out to you, whether it be because of cinematography or other aspects? Oh, uh, I guess some other scenes that kind of uh, stuck out to me was the scenes where he's talking to his father. Um, at like uh, him just kind of slowly stepping away from his father and the conversations that they have about it, I found poignant in some sense, some aspects to it. I agree, too. It, it felt... Uh, kind of like a very good emotional backbone where his father seemed to be very much in denial with what was happening and almost like he didn't like his son because he was not staying kind of stuck in that part of life or, or, yeah. or he was trying to move past it in his own way. And I guess yeah. you could say both were a bit in denial, but just in different ways, perhaps. Yeah, certainly. So you um, you sympathize with the dad character, but you could also see why um, he's all uh, the main character is always looking for work. He's always looking for um, like he's got his mind set on something. And when he those conversations with his father are definitely the most down to earth this movie gets. Yeah, I found myself like it was almost heartbreaking, those conversations with the father, um, like one in particular that I can remember pretty vividly is the father wants to play violin with the son and the son is yeah. like he's too, you know, dead set on this kind of mission, for lack of better terms. So he, he can't. And that like it kind of broke my heart in a way. Yeah. Ethan, I, I want to get uh, your final thoughts for this film I I as well as a rating. Um, I think it has some flaws. I, I think the structure of it kind of makes a lot of things blur for me. Um, the dialogue is kind of a blur for me. But overall, I thought the strengths elevated it quite a bit. Uh, I thought overall it was great. I give it a four out of five. So I'm in complete agreement with you. I gave it a four out of five as well. And, I, you know, that, that sentiment where things kind of blurred, this film kind of blurred into Diabelle for me, where I was it's not. Yeah, I, I really I was like, which which film did this occur in? Um, I felt like Diabell is slightly less flawed out, out, you know, and we'll get to that yeah. in a moment. But I, I definitely agree with a lot of uh, your takes on that. Yes. Uh, the, the next movie we're going to be covering is Diabell. And. Uh, and uh, Ethan, if you would. Ethan, would you like to do the honors and, and do your best to explain Diabelle's plot? Yes. Uh, do my best is probably <laughs> the most important part of that uh, line of questioning. Uh, so Diabelle is about a, a young man who gets out of prison and by this very weird guy, kind of follows him around for the entire movie. And um, it's about him and his uh, downward spiral into madness again as uh, everything all around him falls apart. So I, I absolutely love that as like a premise. And I feel like it was pretty well done by this film. I've always thought it would. Yeah. it's intriguing to have just the, the devil as a character has always intrigued me. And uh, I, yeah. I like the way it was presented in this film. How about you? Uh. To be honest, I didn't know there was even a devil character. Was it the the strange man on who was following him around? Yeah, it was the it was the man in black. Okay, okay, yes, yeah, I thought he was a, a great addition mm -hmm. to the to the cast. And it, it, you know, it's like it it gave physical structure to 
kind of the evil that swayed our main character. Um, yeah. And because it made so much sense for this character to kind of take a darker path because, you know, it's like life just completely passed him by. He's tried, to, you know, he didn't sacrifice himself in that he died, but he gave up a portion of his life. And it seems like he didn't get rewarded at all and quite the opposite, actually. And and that tracks yeah. for pretty much, a, I would say, a lot of soldiers who go overseas or or fight, you know, abroad, that that yeah. might be a sentiment that they can feel you know relate to as well it's about the passage of time slipping away from you which is it, it makes sense when it comes to like the prison angle because mm -hmm. he, he was in this prison for a long time and we get this great opening i actually prefer the opening of this movie to uh to the third part of the night just because it right off the bat it's it's chaotic. There, it's almost like a zombie movie. <laughs> Just a bunch of people screaming in confusion and like blood and killing everywhere. It's crazy. Yeah, it was, it was absolute madness, and uh, it, you know, it felt like the the perfect movie to follow up the third part of the night because it's it does start to ratchet up to that level but diabel just like let's start off at 11 and then make our way from there but you're right man that prison was like it was like hell on earth it reminded yeah. me of uh irreversibles is opening in, oh yeah in a sense i definitely think it's his best opening to to a film absolutely and and it was it was really well done. It let you know right away that it's a chaotic environment, and that chaos bleeds into. Or it's almost inescapable in a sense that our main yeah. character can't get away from this chaos, and it's going to bleed into every aspect of his life. So from that standpoint, it was well done. I thought. Yes, there's a, a number of aspects that I think are considerably better than the third part of the night. The first being, um, I love the character dynamics in Possession, but I love the character dynamics in this as well. I think that's this movie's greatest strength between uh, the main character, uh, uh, Jacob, yeah, his name? I think uh, so. Jacob and uh, the devil. I thought that was really well done. He uh, was such a good character, I thought. Yeah. Yes, I, I feel like having that is kind of the the string that ties together all of these these elements because in the third part of the night you didn't have that really i think the closest thing you had that was the his the doppelganger of the main character's wife yeah and and from that sense it, it definitely plays around with like the psychology of how trauma can affect you and how that uh kind of comes to fruition and how trauma like it'll make you actually kind of lose your perception of reality for lack of a better sense yeah another thing that i i really loved the dynamic with uh jacob right so yeah his sister and his like former lover or what what have you i i thought their relationships yeah. were very they were very interesting in this film. Yes, I thought their relationship, like the the betrayal of relationships in this movie between his sister and her lover and then um, his wife and the king was very interesting. And um, it's definitely a, like a, a surreal... It also has to do with um, like the passage of time uh, when it comes to being in prison, uh, it, it slips away from you and then you become bad again. You become a... You actually start to... Because he starts to, to kill people in, I believe, like the second half. Yeah, he, he slowly kind of descends into madness, I guess you could say. Uh, where yeah. he, he seems like a fairly benevolent force in the first half and then it's like the resentment towards how 
time has passed him by kind of leads to him becoming this this evil force in the second half of the film. It was quite yeah. unique and very interesting, I thought. Yeah. The devil could also be like uh, the the representation of the id, which the id is basically like the devil on your shoulder. That that character is the devil on the main character's shoulder. Um, and there's, I believe, the the orphan that was with him was really just the uh, the super ego, the angel on your shoulder, and um, like he was kind of represented his innocence in a way. That's what I got out of it. I now that you say that, I mean that that seems to be like right on the mark, because obviously the you know the the orphaned nun I believe was very pure. Um, wait, what is the orphan and the nun, or is that the same character? Or is there another character I'm forgetting? I believe, yeah, I believe it is the orphan nun who was locked up with him. Okay. Yes, she seems like almost like a Virgin Mary type character. Um, and she like almost literally gets locked away as the id or the, you know, the man in black or the man or the devil is really takes over. And the main character starts to, you know, do all these evil acts. So, I mean, that was just like a really cool kind of uh dynamic with this film yeah certainly i also i thought that uh the cinematography like we said i thought was pretty good in this one although yeah i I think i would agree with you i mean i'm not sure exactly how you feel but possession and i think the third part of the night uh might have done a little bit of a better job in in my mind yes i think at atmosphere is the strength of the third part of the night, and then um, the characters are this is the greatest strength of uh, of Diabel. They they're both great for different reasons, but um, there's certain aspects of each that I prefer, and then possession is, is I think the best of both. I completely agree. Um, not to not to jump ahead too much, but I absolutely loved possession. Um, but I, I, I very much liked all three of these films and I was kind of surprised by how much I liked them. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I love your interpretation of the, the angel on your shoulder and the, the devil on your shoulder too. And they both, what I think points to that theory, uh, prevailing is that they don't seem to have as much of an outward, influence on anyone besides our main character much like yeah. an internal force that only influences him but not anyone else and i think yeah. that points to what you said being correct yeah because they don't they don't really appear uh when the main character is dealing with uh, outside characters when that happens uh they kind of disappear whereas um they come back when they're kind of they're kind of alone and they're not they don't really interact with other characters that much yeah and the, and the only other characters that they really interact with is each other you know the the devil yeah. and the the nun will interact with with one another but that's about it so like it is like an internal force and 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 it makes sense that the devil would kind of take hold be- after all of these unfortunate events happening to our main character um yes i guess there's two things and and these might be hard to answer because i the the reason i'm asking is because i don't really have a solid answer myself the it seemed like one of the big goals for the devil character was he wanted him to give up the names of his associates and that's ultimately I th- like what he maybe got him to do in the end. Although I don't, I don't think he did. I thought our main character just signed the paper. I mean, was that like the ultimate evil to give up the people that he cared about? Is that why that was the goal of the devil? Do you think? Yeah, I, that there could be many speculations to that. Um, 
like he has descended so he the devil wanted him to descend to this level so he could sort of um be almost desperate almost to like a sort of desperation angle yeah and um uh, one thing that I wanted to mention, the ending scene where the devil, like, pretty much, uh, like, shoots our main character in the face, that was, like, that was a great shot. It, and that might not, for lack of a better phrase, but th the effect yeah. done there was, like, amazing, and it was pretty shocking as well. Yes. I, I'm trying to think. I, you know, I saw an interpretation uh, not too long ago, and it's that kind of like there's a reason the devil, he says, well, the only way I can explain this type of evil is to like do an interpretive dance. And I feel like that kind of ties into your theory as well, where we often kind of envision evil as like we think of it as a physical force rather than actions that we take where we could choose the right thing. Does, it, does that make any yes. sense? I, I mean, what, yes. what are your kind of thoughts on that? Well, um, I mean, I could easily go to uh, Halloween ends <laughs> um, if you've seen Halloween Ends um, I actually kind of recommend it I think it's a decent movie but um, I think it's, this is definitely like complete opposites where uh, have you seen Halloween Ends at all? I have um, let's just let's let's talk about it because and we'll get back to Diabelle but I, uh, I watched yeah. it and I've been dying to, to talk about it with someone yes I, um, I see so, where you're coming from as far as it yes, being enjoyable. They come they come to the realization that the uh that evil spreads kind of like a virus and um there's many interpretations of evil in mm -hmm. the world. And um I think that's just a kind of a center point of uh, uh, of a lot of movies but specifically the Halloween franchise cuz that that Halloween Ends movie uh, has themes that tie back to the original movie, Evil. What What is evil? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, Michael Myers is seen as, like, the rendition of evil. Um, but uh, it kind of... Halloween Ends ties back to that. I, I know people hate Halloween Ends. Um, it's not an amazing movie. I mm -hmm. think the 2018 Halloween is better. Um, Halloween Kills is a steaming pile of dog crap, but Agreed. back to Diet Bell now. <laughs> <laughs> let me just uh, let me just make one point. Um, yes. First of all, you bring up a really good point because it's like, you know, are people born evil? And and it seems like the original yeah. Halloween takes a huge stance in that that might be the case, right? This yeah. one I yeah. do really like your. You you know you extrapolating the fact that it's like evil can even uh, like easily spread, and you know it might be something as simple as being misunderstood or, or framed in a light that isn't fair, that can make you evil. So it's almost like the flip side of the coin in a way where it's like maybe you're not born evil, but you can be made to be evil. A la Diabelle. You know, it's like the, our main character wasn't wasn't evil the entire time. He became yes. that way. He was influenced by a, a, a outside a, a force in his mind, so to speak. The the one thing that just my last last take, and then if you want to, you know, re reboot or you know have a rebuttal, then I would be glad to hear it. It's mm -hmm. Halloween ends. And it, it started in Halloween Kills. They just lose its grounding in reality where it's like, and I get it. The first one does have like supernatural elements with Michael Myers, 
where you know he'll get shot and then it's like oh where the hell do you go okay yeah this one it's yeah. like he's he's like a superhero or a supervillain it's yeah. it just it, it 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 lost the grounding and and by taking it as far as they did it lost the mysticism of what that character is that's my take but i do really like what you brought up and it and there what like it wasn't like it wasn't like it was terribly shot when people said yeah. they hated it as much as they did i was like expecting it to be like really really bad um i i like it more than halloween kills but i just i don't know i I think the main reason why I enjoy Halloween ends because it was different. It was a different approach to Halloween, which the 13th in the series, not going to be super effective, but I think it works as far as I think the last 20 minutes suck as -hmm. far as what they were trying to do. Um, But overall, I think it just works so, so much better than Halloween Kills. I watched Halloween Kills right before I went to the theater and watched Halloween Ends. Wow. It is <laughs> bad. <laughs> and you know what? I think you brought up a good point is that the ending is what it, that's always going to resonate with people the most. Yeah. And I think yeah. the fact that the ending just it's it it went the direction that it did and it, it went hard yeah. in that direction. I think that it didn't yeah, the ending didn't live up to what the rest of the movie was trying to go for. And but what I I like this movie more than Halloween Kills because Halloween Kills tried to be like all political mm-hmm. with its messages mm-hmm. and <laughs> it it's trying to be a, like a lot more than what it actually is, which is what it which is like generic and its presentation, but has some interesting ideas. That was trying to be like, oh, uh, this is about... uh," Because Jamie Lee Curtis did an interview about it, and she she was like, uh, this uh, now can uh, can be compared to Black Lives Matter protests, because that was what, what was going on a year prior to when Halloween Kills came out, and I was like... This is not, no, the <laughs> political messaging does not work for how, for a Halloween movie, for a stupid Halloween movie. Yeah. Uh, like have some interesting ideas and go for some more interesting interpretations of Halloween, but don't try and make it political or have this weird, uh, thematic subtext that has nothing to do with the essence of Halloween. That's what I don't like about Halloween Kills. I, th- that's a really, really good point. It's, uh, it's just, that movie is not elevated enough to be able to make commentary on anything effectively, right? It just, yes. it feels as, as cheap as a lot of the things that went on in the movie to, to try yeah. and do that. Um, which, which brings me to, I completely see why you would think Halloween Ends is not a good movie, but there are people who will defend Halloween Kills over Halloween Ends, and I just do not understand it. Yeah, I, I have to be completely on. I don't know how you could. The yeah, Halloween Kills was it was it was yeah. garbage. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you you brought like. And I think I felt like a jilted lover because they did have a, a plot line going that was interesting. And it just, it seemed like they kind of abandoned it at the end um, yeah. or that the payoff wasn't what it should have been. So exactly. So, you know, that that left a bad taste in my mouth. And then how they mm. ended everything, I was like, OK, um, I, yeah, you know, I guess that's how we're going with it. But I yep. s- you see it for what. You, like you are uh, optimistic about like what it actually brought to the table. And I totally respect that because, you know, I was actually enjoying myself. Like I'm like halfway into the movie. I'm like, this is not nearly as bad as people made it out to be, but yeah, 
then the the tide turned in in my viewing experience. Yes, very yes. So Diabelle. <laughs> <laughs> I I have to say I I really enjoyed this movie and uh, I I only jumped on the opportunity to talk about Halloween just because. It'll probably be one of the only times I, I get to have a good conversation about yeah. it. But uh, As, yeah, I'm glad I got my thoughts out about it because um, uh, in my circle of people that I that I hang out with, they also say that it sucks. <laughs> it, it's good to you know we get to because seeing your perspective, I can kind of see where you're coming from. You know, definitely like, for for a better. Um, a better look at it, like a much more in-depth look. I would recommend Red Letter Media's video on it. I think they did a great job. I love uh, them, by the way. Yes, favorite movie critic channel. They are very funny. Yes, <laughs> but um, no, that's that, that. Their review is what prompted me to go see it because they. I I was expecting them to to stomp on it too, mm-hmm. and but they liked it, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go watch this. Exactly. And before even watching the whole review, but all I heard was that they liked it. So I went and watched it and I have to agree. I think it was really interesting. Yeah. And uh, this film, this is, you know, Diabelle, this is one that mm-hmm. I think is. And it's I think it's a consistency throughout all of Zulowski's films. He brings a lot to the table and it's something that seems to continuously influence him as a director and I think it's like getting inside the mind of great conflict I feel like he's great psychologically painting the picture of what it feels like to be in these uh, desperate situations yes and I think he when it comes to the structure of that I think he got it so right with um like as time went on and as his, as he made more movies and his, his knack for the chaos, but the uh, controlled chaos of his movies, Mm -hmm. I think it, he, he really came to a head with it in, uh, in possession. Yes. And that is the third film that we watched and probably like we were saying earlier, his most famous, film i said this on my letterbox review and uh i'm gonna say it again i'm watching this movie the entire time i'm looking at the the male protagonist or maybe antagonist for for lack of a better term i'm like this i'm like i know this this guy looks like an actor i've seen i'm like he 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 looks like the guy from uh, from (laughs) from jurassic park (laughs) The, well, the the movie that came to my mind was Event Horizon. Really, yeah. really. I'm like, that's he, crazy. I'm like, he looks like a mixture between Daniel Day Lewis and the guy from Event Horizon. And at the end, I'm like, I gotta look it up, like who this guy is. I'm like, is it just some some guy? Because he had that an accent, and that's yeah. why I thought it wasn't the same guy. But turns yes. out it is Sam Neill from Jurassic Sam Neil, Park, as you said. Because he's New Zealand. He's New Ze- he's is a he New really? Zealand actor. Yeah, I he's from New that. Zealand. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think does he have we an need accent? to give our... Does he have an he accent does. in his other films? Um, not necessarily. I think in The Mouth of Madness he had a little bit of an accent. Um, okay. I think we forgot to give our ratings for Diabelle, though. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What was uh, what was your rating, Ethan? And then any final thoughts as well? Uh, I give it a four out of five. Uh, that We already gave our thoughts. I, I okay. think I'll just give the rating four out of five. I gave it a four out of five as well. And uh, what, the one thing I will say, I, I prefer Diabelle just slightly over third part of the night. I agree. You? I agree. I think we're in agreement on all three of these movies, to be honest. Yep, I I think so as well. And uh, just, you know, spoiler alert, I won't give away my rating, but uh, I think Possession is rightfully the most famous because I I do think it is Zulowski's best horror film. 
in my far mind. and away. Yeah, far and away, definitely. So, this is very much the story of a breakup, but it has some absolutely bonkers horror elements uh, injected into it. Uh, yes. that, that's my summary for this one. How did you yeah. feel about the acting and uh, any any other initial thoughts too? I I was really happy. I, I I this is weird, but I was really happy to see Sam Neill. I think uh, he's a really really great actor. Uh, not in just Jurassic Park, but I think he was great in, in The Mouth of Madness. And this might actually be my favorite performance by him. Just his downward spiral as he tries to figure out what his wife is doing, who's played by uh, Isabelle Ajani, a French actress. She is fantastic in this movie. Um, so memorable. And uh, But I, I love seeing Sam Neill because it gives you kind of that it gave me kind of that uh, that familiar feeling that grounds this movie for me. I, I completely agree with you. And uh, I, I just I want to go a little bit into the background as to how this movie came to pass. And uh, Ethan, have you heard anything about how Zulowski came to to write this film? Wasn't this based off of his own like breakup yes so it was him and i and i don't know what was the the basis of his divorce but he was going through a divorce with his wife and and i can't remember who the friend was but he had planned to end his own life actually and someone reached out to him and said, hey, look, come to New York, like, give it a week and, you know, like, try to try to get through this. So he had a good friend. I want to say it's Roger Ebert, but I am not sure on that. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong down in the comments it's, below. But uh, it's a much it's a much darker version of uh, Noah Baumbach with Marriage Story because he also based that movie off of his own uh, divorce. Oh, really? so in you can watching it with that knowledge holy you can really yeah. tell this movie comes from a deeply emotionally like damaged and hurt yes. standpoint um, yeah but what's another great thing is that um you wouldn't think that this movie had an event that would put you into the story similar to his other two but this is based on the time where the where Eastern and Western Germany were blocked off by the Berlin Wall. And they were, they were living, the story takes place in Berlin, like right next to the wall. And some shots are, are legitimately just next to the wall. Oh, and wow. it creates, it's like a, people have speculated that it's sort of a, a metaphor for like emotional blockage because of this uh, aff- like affair that's going on between the two characters. That's a real, that's really interesting. And I have to say, like, I really love those like kind of added details where director, it, yeah. it's just, I I've always had an affinity for how directors minds work. Cause that's just yeah. something I could never think of. I feel like, you know what I mean? Yeah. To, to to actually place it there and for and whether it was like a subconscious thing that he did or whether it was totally intentional the whole way through but I'll be honest I didn't I didn't notice that but it definitely did kind of have this weird like the the place that they were living in this outside environment mm-hmm. it almost did feel alien for you know lack of a better term. Yeah. And that yeah. that plays into kind of Sam Neill's work for certain, where like it's very sketchy what he's doing. You're like, I, I don't really like, is he a spy? Who the hell is the guy with the pink socks? That was all interesting. And, and, and like a lot of great reveals didn't really come until the very end of what was going on. But uh, yes. the emotional reverberations that happened in this were just downright immaculate. I I have to say, 
it's I was planning on rewatching this movie. Um, d- unfortunately, I didn't get to it, but th- even like watching it months ago, I could still like vividly remember a lot of the stuff that happens. Unlike the third part of the night and Diabelle, which I watched uh, over the past couple of days. It's, it's totally sticks with you. Um, for example, the scene where the, you know, the, the actress, the, the lead actress is just like losing her mind in the underpass of a subway oh, station. Yeah. That is yep. like, that's going to be burned in my memory for a long time. <laughs> that's yes. for sure. That yeah. Was- Isabel and Johnny, she did an amazing job. And it it, wor- it works so well for this film. And then like the domestic abuse, um, the the self inflicted injuries that they did to themselves, like those all are just like burned into my mind. Like those those scenes just played out. I think exactly how Zulowski wanted them to play out. Uh, is, th- is there any other scenes that kind of stick out to you, or or maybe? outlining why you think those scenes stick out so well there's a lot um i guess one that sticks out to me is when uh sam neill's character is going through like a really bad time and he stays at this like apartment building and he stays he's locked he locks himself in there for like months and he starts to like grow white (laughs) like he turns like pale and he, he starts to go like so insane and uh, i just i thought that was very powerful as far as an interesting like emotional like a short emotional breakdown yeah it was done super well and very efficiently like you said like you 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 instantly got how much pain this character was in and yeah. you know it, and it was only over the course of like a minute or two and you just get that because of how it was presented um that was a scene that made me that's when i thought i might have an idea where this film was going but it went so off the wall and i could not yeah. have predicted <laughs> where this film actually went that's for sure yeah and um like obviously the big reveal that this movie is not a psychological trauma, but a creature feature yes. in the most disturbing, brutal, uh, shocking way. Um, which is, I love when, when directors use those over-exaggerated um, like creatures as like a metaphor for the, the very strong themes of the film when they're interconnected in that way, it, it, it felt like Zulowski had his finger on the pulse when it came to just how uh, controlled and how much he knew about this feeling that the characters are going through. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I kind of want to get your mindset. You feel like the the... What do you feel like it was an analogy for? Like, what message do you think Zulowski was trying to get across with this this actual manifestation of a, a creature slash monster? Well, that's her like her side piece. That's her affair. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's her lover who has her under its its grasp. I'm not going to say he or her because it's definitely not either. It's just this vague disgusting octopus monster that is a metaphor for the emotional struggle the the emotional entrapment that Mm -hmm. that affairs uh bestow upon um upon their their victims in a sort of way did you feel like there was also some subtext there as to um, like Sam Neill's control over Isabella's character? Yeah, it, it definitely feels like she like you don't like marriage story. <laughs> you don't you don't root for either one. Like you don't side with either one. Both of them are going through a really rough time. 
um, Sam Neill is trying desperately to cling on to to her to his wife, and um, so is the the monster. There was uh, there was one kind of scene that I was trying to interpret in my mind, um, and I and I think Isabella's character she named there. I, I think there was two monsters. And she named one Faith, and she named one Chance. And apparently, that when she loses her stuff uh, in the the subway underpass, it was like in mourning of the death of I think maybe Faith. And I, I was, tr- could, did you could you wrap your head around what? the subtext of that was uh, did you have any interpretations or did it kind of go overlooked on your viewing i did not even know that they had names to be honest um but there could be some sort of because obviously um a, having an affairs is there's a slang for it. it's called being unfaithful mm. and um there there could be some sort of uh of message behind like a, a a connecting tissue into this uh this pool of uh, of a movie about about like uh, damaged love in a sort of way yeah exactly and and you know at the end the the creature begins or it becomes fully formed and looks exactly like Sam Neill in the end so yes. from that sense, it was like it's it's to parallel him and, and their dynamic, I, I assume. And I wonder if the other monster, for lack of a better term, was to be that kind of that one boyfriend who ends up getting murdered by Sam Neill's character. Maybe so. That's just my take. Um, it, maybe it was because she thought that being with him would be able to uh, maybe free her of the inner turmoil she had in the relationship with Sam Neill, but it, it didn't turn out quite the way she had expected. So that is like the death of that monster. And maybe yeah. like she's so enraptured by Sam Neill, his presence in the relationship, and she just really can't escape him. And that's why that monster lives through the end of the movie. Yeah. Well, correction. Uh, you don't side with either one of them until the end, I guess. Yes, and uh, the ending was really dramatic, and it and it reintroduces the people that work with Sam Neil, and that was another thing that went completely over my head. I I don't, I don't, I did not understand. <laughs> I didn't understand that part of it. Uh, too much. Did did you really get a, a good grasp of the ending? Not really. <laughs> I still <laughs> I enjoyed the hell out of it though, just despite yes. that. Um, oh, from start to finish, this movie is a uh, pacing too. Like you'd expect some something like this to be very like a very slow, dramatic art house film. It's a fast paced movie. The editing is very unconventional in a way that almost makes it fast paced. Oh, absolutely. It, it didn't have that slow glacial pace. Like you said that you may expect it was just like, you know, foot on the pedal. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to make one comparison that this film kind of drew in my mind. And I think it, it really just stems from the, the creature and that movie is Hellraiser. Um, did you kind of yes. get that in your mind? You got it as well. Uh, yeah, y- yes. Um, like that, that emotional manipulate. It's more emotionally manipulate manipulating than it is emotionally, um, fencing that Sam Neil does in Possession. But uh, Hellraiser is more about emotional manipulation because it's about uh a woman's side piece coming back and is manipulating her into um, doing stuff for him. Yes. And uh, 
I think the the scene that I like it really struck me was when she had that room that she was keeping the the monster in, and like yes. she murdered. I think the first victim was the private investigator, and I was like, damn, yes. that's like that feels a lot like like Hellraiser. That uh, yeah, it does feel like Hellraiser. Interesting comparison. I haven't watched Hellraiser in a, in a long time, actually, so... It's, uh... The original, I should say. Yeah. Did you watch the new one? No. I've heard simultaneously good and bad things about it. It's a it's a mixed bag. That's that's for sure. It, you know, it wasn't great, mm-hmm. but it wasn't bad either. That That's, yes. that's my take. Um, but, I mean, the, the standout, I thought, in this film was... The, the chemistry or I guess lack thereof or the dynamic between Isabella and Sam Neill and, and yes. how they acted just everything about their interactions yes. were, were beautiful. Yes, yes, yes. I definitely agree with that. Do you have any final thoughts and a rating on this one, Ethan? Um, I love this movie. Um, there are some moments where it kind of took me out of it, which is why I can't, I I so desperately want to call it a 10. Mm -hmm. I'd probably like have to rewatch it, uh, Mm -hmm. sometime. Maybe I'll give it a 10 out of 10, but as it stands, it's still a fantastic movie. So I give it a four and a half out of five. Yep. I'm right there with you. Um, there's some... It's like a, a realistic, horrific imagery in this. And then yes. the, the the creature, you know, uh, moments, too, are equally as horrific. But to be able to kind yeah. of blend those two into one film, I think, this it makes it a really great, uh, like, top-tier yes. horror film, for sure. Absolutely. My, I guess my final questions would be have you seen on the silver globe no i've i've only seen these three movies okay i i haven't seen it either um and i guess what are what are some of your takeaways of uh, from andre zulowski as a director i think he's extremely fascinating in his approach to filmmaking i really want to uh, watch some more of his movies because he, he really does seem very, very interesting. And I, I hope that I can watch On the Silver Globe, love it, and call him one of my favorite horror filmmakers. Absolutely. Uh, we we should maybe do a, a part two at some point in the future with uh, Zulowski because I'm very interested in that as well. And uh, yes. He has a, a very distinct taste. I think we said that at the beginning, but it bears repeating. This is a director, while you're watching him, if you've seen one of his other films, you're going to be like, yes. I mean, this this fits what you would expect. It's bombastic. It's crazy. He has a lot of elements like where where characters become one another. There's a lot of like doppelganger style kind of in, in his writing. And uh, I, I, I just love when you see a director that has a very distinct taste. So that was very interesting getting to uh, to watch this trilogy because you really get to discover that, I feel. Yeah, certainly. Well, Ethan, I, I very much appreciate you coming on and I, I really enjoyed this conversation. So so thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. Again. Uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe to this channel, but don't stop there. Go to Ethan's channel and check out his analysis, check out his short films, and also check out his letterbox, which will be linked down in the description below so you can see what he's watching and his reviews and ratings on that as well. Um, thank you guys for joining us, and we will catch you on the next episode. Flippity floop. <laughs>